I'm Leila Atassi with the Northeast Ohio Media Group, and I'm joined by NAOMG columnist Mark Namek. Today, Cleveland Mayor Frank Jackson, U.S. Attorney Stephen Dettelbach, and other U.S. Justice Department officials announced that they have reached a consent decree that will govern policing in Cleveland, specifically the use of force by Cleveland police officers, and will bring accountability and transparency to the Cleveland Police Department. Uh, Mark, this is a sweeping, comprehensive agreement that creates layers of independent review, uh, reporting practices, provides for better training, um, and for collecting community feedback regularly. What, uh, to you, uh, what features of this agreement stand out as, as have, carrying the most potential for long-lasting reform? I think it, we have to point to what really started this whole investigation, and that was the use of force. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this 105-page agreement, there's you know, lots and lots of detail, but it is uh, how we're going to oversee the police department. They're going to put a civilian uh, over the internal review process or internal uh, investigation unit, mm -hmm. uh, also known as internal affairs. Um, there's also going to be an inspector general uh, that will be independent of the police department that the mayor has to hire that will, over, will report to him and oversee the department. And then as you drill down into this agreement, it is going to require, and this may be a bad thing for police in the long run, we'll see in terms of, of, uh, of how they can keep up, but a lot of paperwork uh, to re begin reporting every time they, you know, pull out the gun, the pepper spray, um, they're going to have to file reports. They're going to have to identify uh, in, in, in detail, and it specifically says they can't use mm -hmm. boilerplate language. They've got to explain what the scenario was, what situation were they in, um, and they have to identify officers on the scene uh, involved in those that witnessed the use of force to try to, again, bring this accountability and transparency to the process. Mm -hmm. This agreement also requires a number of deadlines be set on, say, civilian complaints or a use of force complaint that gets filed. We know uh, many lawyers have filed uh, cases against the city that show that these complaints weren't being processed, weren't being heard, they were hearing nothing back. Now this sets out some time frames. And another major component is that there will be a, a, a monitor who will be hired, I think you might have mentioned that, in addition to the, um, uh, the Inspector General of Police, this will be the monitor who sort of oversees and works in, in conjunction with the Inspector General. Uh, and it has to be someone who knows law enforcement, who knows uh, civil rights issues, do you think that, you know, immediately I wonder if this is someone who, who someone who fits that description is, is um, you know, is it best that they come from the Cleveland community or do you think that, you know, that that might create issues, that that might be a lawyer who uh, has, has had legal, you know, has filed lawsuits against the city in the past or should this be an outsider who's looking upon Cleveland with fresh eyes? What's your view on that? Well, I think we can make a, a, a pro and con case for either one. Um, I. I think the person should have, first and foremost, the understanding of how police operate. And throughout this agreement, when they have someone that is, uh, that, that, that when the agreement calls for someone to come in, that person cannot currently be working for the department. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where they're trying to create that wall. Um, I think they need to know the department and the culture here in the community. But they also can't be a former, law, a former Cleveland police officer. Correct. So that might uh, tilt the scale to bringing someone from the outside. I think mm -hmm. this is, and, and they have to agree to it uh, with the monitor. Um, and I think I should have said early on, with any agreement, which is known as a consent decree, which gets filed in federal court and is overseen by a judge, um, that these, almost every decision is gonna be monitored by the court as well. Right now there's a five year, at least a five year, uh, I guess, time frame on this for the city to, to enact all of these things. They can go longer or shorter mm -hmm. as time goes on. Things will ramp up uh, in, the, in the, the latter years because they need time to assess everything. But to get back to your point, I don't know who will be best suited and that's gonna be part of the ongoing negotiations. Mm -hmm. You mentioned also the, a number of committees that will be created in addition to what is already there, like the Office of Professional Standards. Um, you know, the, so you know, the Community Police Commission will be one, which makes recommendations to the chief on community policing and bias-free policing issues, transparency, et cetera, sort of like a liaison to the community, it seems. That's a 13-member um, uh, police member, right. uh, exactly. commission that has to get 
put together. Look, I'm always leery when I hear commissioning committees right. to study poverty, to study you know, housing needs, to study job training. We hear about it all the time. What's different here is that we have, again, a, a judge, a monitor, uh, overseeing that see that this becomes um, you know, less about uh, donuts and coffee once a month right. and more about action. And in fact, on that uh, commission, um, you know, they're going to outline specifically who should be on it and how it needs to go on. You just mentioned uh, bias-free policing, yeah. and I, I probably would put that at the top of my list of things in here in this report that surprised me and that could potentially have the most impact. Uh, when the Justice Department launched the investigation in March of, uh, I think, 2012, Oh, no, that's when the city asked them to come in and look. Mm -hmm. So it was a little over a year before we saw it again. Um, they didn't identify that in, in the scathing report. Uh, yeah. I, I, I smile when I say that term because that became the, <laughs> the go-to word. word for yeah, this. But exactly. it was highly critical of the use of force. Uh, the investigation reviewed 600 pages or 600 police reports, thousands of materials related and did interviews. They didn't talk about bias-free policing, which is this idea. Is the police department stopping people based on right. race? Are they violating rights when they search and seize property? This sets forth some specific documentation and review of that documentation related to bias policing to see if, hey, in the next eight months did we discover that in fact we do have a problem. Mm -hmm. Again, something that was not initially looked at. Right. Um, I think that's significant. But Dettelbach said, um, he has said that, that including that in the consent decree is a testament to the fact that they listened to what people had to say at all of the community forums that they hosted, where they invited members of the public to come and speak their mind, uh, that they paid attention, and that that was a recurrent theme in the things they had to say. And then also, Mayor Jackson has said that his embracing bias-free policing as, as an element of the consent decree is a testament to how seriously he takes the, these reforms and that he want, he's not just looking to dodge a lawsuit, but looking to institute change that will outlive him as mayor. And I thought that was a very powerful uh, statement on, on both of their behalf. I had to be reminded of this uh, the other day by our boss, Chris Quinn, that at the mayor's first press conference, uh, when he first took office, he declared that reforming the police department would be his yeah. most important legacy um, and most important thing. At the time he came in, uh, there were 30-some lawsuits against the city for use of force, including uh, maybe four or five that actually involved uh, yeah. d the death of a, uh, of a resident. Yeah. And these were pretty big things. And then, you know, as years went on, kind of it faded from our minds, uh, the public's minds, and then as we know in these recent cases, uh, dating back maybe a year or two. Right, and Jackson has tried so hard through the years to implement all sorts of policy changes, and I think that there was this growing frustration that many of them weren't really gaining the traction that he hoped for, and uh, you know, when, when the opportunity arose to develop the mm -hmm. consent decree, he said publicly that uh, that he saw it as the greatest opportunity of his career to date when it comes to, you know, the, the chance to really uh, dig into yeah. the issue of, of police excessive use of force. And this isn't over. Um, and as anybody that's paid attention to these kind of agreements, um, they're difficult to uh, carry out. Yeah. We've seen in New Orleans, which I think was put under the agreement in 2012, uh, there was a lot of pushback because of cost, and we can talk about that in a minute. And, uh, you know, the city uh, police officers and the unions in the city were, you know, I think they may have even filed a lawsuit uh, on that one and since have come back together mm -hmm. uh, because there are things that they may discover, hey, we just can't, A, uh, carry out, can't afford. Um, and that's where we're going to have to see leadership both by the city and the Justice Department step up to make sure yeah. that we can get as much of this agreement as possible uh, yeah. and, and realistic is really the, the issue I'm probably looking for. There are a lot of other things in here that are probably worth mentioning that tie specifically to some high profile cases. Mm -hmm. uh, one being the Tanisha Anderson who um, was called, uh, who police were called to, 
to deal with. She uh, was suffering from mental illness, mm -hmm. and the family called um, after a, a scuffle with police during that interaction, she died. And there's been a lot of talk about why aren't more police officers trained for crisis intervention, mental health, or yeah. related issues. Um, this actually sets out a, a pretty specific uh, plan that includes essentially creating yeah. a SWAT team for crisis intervention with mental health. They want to have some specific officers volunteer, be trained, to be on call 24-7 to go out in those situations and it's calling for uh, requiring the city to do more intervention crisis training for all officers. Yeah. Uh, that ties specifically to that case. Uh, there was another famous case of uh, Edward Henderson uh, who was uh, arrested after a police chase, uh, was on the ground in handcuffs and was beaten. Nothing came of this until a video surfaced, an infrared video. Mm -hmm. uh, there were three or four officers directly involved in the arrest, several more watching. And uh, to this date, years later, no one has ever identified who the officers are that were involved in that, sp specifically who hit them. No one has been charged. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the Justice Department looked at that case and came away saying, we can't say because no one would testify. And right. to this date, no one ever wrote down on paperwork. Uh, who should who was involved specifically? Right. This seems to set a little more pressure on identifying people immediately involved and requiring supervisors to look at that paperwork right away to say who was involved. Right. Uh, so there's two examples, uh, Tanisha Anderson, in this uh, where you, you're seeing some of these high-profile cases being addressed in here. Right, and it also specifically addresses the fact that officers should not be using force on someone who is in handcuffs unless they are posing a further threat to the safety of officers. And so that, you know, on the use of force specifically, which is one of the you know, marquee findings of the Justice Department's uh, report that was released in December, um, the decree provides guidelines for limiting the use of force in situations in which it's absolutely necessary. Um, obviously, you know, this obviously will call upon the officers new training and de-escalation techniques and crisis intervention and things like that. But it also outlines those prohibited uses of force when someone is handcuffed, mm -hmm. when the subject is only verbally attacking an officer. Um, retaliation is strictly prohibited. Um, no head strikes with hard objects unless lethal force is justified in that situation. And no force is to be used on a person who is not suspected of criminal activity unless they are threatening the officer's safety. Officers are not allowed to, to pistol whip suspects any further, which I think had, had sort of, the, you know, the Justice Department had indicated that that had become kind of a common practice, yeah. that they would hit, hit the, uh, the um, suspect with a, the butt of, of their gun. Um, and every, every use of force case will be accurately documented, as you said. And every time an officer unholsters a firearm, it must be reported. And every five second deployment of a taser. So if, um, if a, a, an officer uses a taser multiple times on one suspect, each of those triggers its own reporting uh, process. Every five uh, or every spray with the chemical spray that they use, pepper is spray, the pepper is spray, commonly known right, as or OC spray, in, is, in is considered terms. you know an action that triggers its own reporting protocol. Do you think that in any way this could unduly burden officers who are in the field? I mean, obviously, it's like, those are high intensity moments for them to have to keep track of every time they use yeah, one I, of I these elements. Yeah, I mean, at elements. first blush, it seems un unrealistic and, and maybe. Uh, they recognize that, but by being so uh, stringent in the requirement that they'll maybe find, ultimately get to some middle ground. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. We have to wait and see what the police union reaction is to this. Uh, we, they they ha have been involved in the negotiations, uh, mostly on the outside, mm -hmm. um, but they have been calling for more training, better equipment. Uh, specific equipment is not spelled out in the agreement, you're, you're not going to see the Justice Department say you have to hire or have to buy a certain type of police car. They are requiring an evaluation kind of inventory of, of, of the issues, and there is a requirement to begin, again, upgrading. Um, but again, they're not really saying yeah. where. I think the police officers will not like the paperwork. Uh, maybe the union will, you know, take action. I, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, this is fresh. We're just getting this now. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, we know some of the background and we'll see where, where that takes them. When, when we were talking about bias-free policing earlier and, and um, you know, all that's in the consent decree that addresses those issues, that really speaks to the culture of policing, though. And culture is one of those things that it's all about what's in the officer's heart and mind. Is that, do you think that that is, that, that a document or, or policies or training even could, can, can really change that? I, I think it can help. And in, in, in this agreement, they are talking about specific training on cultural and in dealing with uh, what are biases, bias issues that you're mm -hmm. gonna encounter and, and I guess why that matters. Uh, there's a whole uh, element of this agreement that's talking about community policing and let's face it, community policing is accepting and understanding that neighborhood that you're covering, yeah. black, white, whatever, and all officers are gonna have to go through it. Um, those things, I mean, the belief is that that will, will make you a, a more aware, more enlightened officer. Now. Uh, again, they may say, hey, that's unrealistic. We, it's all, it should be all about training and you know, we're putting our lives on the line and uh, first and foremost is right. getting home to our family. That's what we hear a lot from officers. They think all of this sounds great on paper, but in practice, it's not realistic. Right. But I think everything in here is pushing the department to, to get there, that more training and the emphasis on on this. And I think just even the agreement itself generates more sunshine through the media, through the monitor that this yeah. stuff needs to be carried out. Well, and also I think that the, um, the role of supervisors is, is, you know, throughout the consent decree, it mentions how, how, how great the responsibility of supervisors is in, in making sure that, that the message is clear that racial profiling and anything you know, related to their, the biases of officers will not be tolerated. And that at, at, you know, if, if officers are held accountable, that you know, incrementally yeah. that might change the, the culture of policing. Yeah, yeah, I, it, that's something that we've been talking about for a couple of years. Yeah. And now is, you're seeing some of it put into, in, into print. Uh, I've been teasing the audience here with this idea of cost. Um, yeah. there, there's no, figure put on this mm -hmm. at this point. Part of that is they have to assess cost of training, right. staffing levels, um, and equipment, but it's, you know, the figures are all over the board and they're staggering, you know, five, 11 million, 20 million, depending on which city is talking. Um, I know the mayor has talked to the public before about concerns about the city budget, and you've yeah. covered that closely. What do you think they have? Do they have the money uh, to put in five million dollars right over the next year and a half? You know, and talking with equipment when and, we spoke with the mayor about the issue of cost as it relates to the consent decree, he sounded somewhat uncertain. I don't know if you'd agree to that. He yeah. he really um, he didn't give give away anything as far as where that money will come from. And I do know uh, intimately how how cash-strapped the city is and how there are forces coming at the city uh, from all angles, um, cuts to, to local government funding from the yeah. state, um, and all, all sorts of, of uh, pressures on the city budget. The city, at the end of the year, for the last several, you know, for a, yeah. for a long time, has really just, has done, has, has really had to tighten its belt just to, you know, squeak by at the end of the year with a $2 million yeah. cushion. Um, so that will be a very important story that will develop in the coming months. Yeah, and what we don't know is how much of the negotiation between U.S. Attorney Steve Dettelbach and Mayor Jackson, which uh, took place, uh, you know, a couple times a week between the two uh, men, yeah. while their lawyers hashed out specific details. What we don't know is maybe the mayor said, "Look, we can you cannot in put in specific requirements for." equipment, police cars, um, we've got to have the flexibility to do that over time because of the budget restraints. Right. Um, You're right. They did, they did indicate that this doesn't have to all be done at once. The, the timeline is stretched out yeah. over, you know, in some cases, you know, several years. And, and, they, and they're all over the board. There's a number of think tanks that have done the um, look at all of these agreements around the country and they have the timelines are all over the board a couple of years ongoing five years depends on how, yeah. how detailed they were uh, I don't want to forget to talk about body cameras which is another oh, yeah. issue 
uh, you and I have both looked at and the city's talked a lot about in the last year. Mm -hmm. The agreement actually notes body cameras as something the city does not have to purchase mm -hmm. to fulfill the terms of this. I thought that was surprising actually. I thought yeah. for sure it would, it would come into play. Yeah, there is, it, it specifically says is not required uh, to uh, buy, buy cameras, but it says if the city does decide to use them, which they which are, they, ha they are, they are calling for things that the city said they're already doing, yeah. is uh, some very strong guidelines about the use and data collection related to these and retention mm -hmm. of, of that data. And so I'm not sure what will, if, you know, if the city's going to, continue to purchase, I, I, I don't think they've, uh, we, we're still testing them, but I don't know how many officers ultimately will wear them in the field if the yeah. goal is everyone. Yeah, the go yeah, you're right, the goal is everyone. Um, you know, it, we talked bef uh, earlier about uh, how the mayor has said that this has been one of his most important, one of the most important issues to him his entire career as mayor. Do you think that this will be his legacy, this, you know, the change that will, that will stem from this consent decree? Uh, obviously, you know, there, there are many things happening in the city. There's all sorts of downtown transformation, the RNC coming, and, and he will, if this is his last term, walk out of office with those things behind him. But will this sort of take the, uh, the prize? Uh, absolutely, and here's why. I, I can never uh, forget this quote. Uh, from the word church, and it was one of the community forums right after uh, the Tamir Rice shooting. And uh, one of Cleveland's you know, top ministers uh, said, you know, Mayor, I'm paraphrasing here, of course, you, know, you can have your, your downtown buildings and your projects, but what I'm gonna remember is you know, the death of a 12-year-old boy the hands of the police department. Yeah. Um, making reform and change that uh, could have that kind of, uh, could have huge impact on the residents, residents by far would be the kind of legacy that I think the mayor and, and any, any mayor would want, want to leave behind and that this is the, the one. Now whether he can carry all of this out or not, but the fact that we're moving towards reform yeah. is, is going to be the marker uh, and can't, forget about the, the schools, which was, you know, another of course, one of those legacy the issues, but, the, but this one and that idea that, you know, don't give me your buildings and your downtowns, give me a police department that yeah. citizens can trust. Um, I think to, to kind of wrap up, we've, we've put a lot on the city here and, you know, I plan to, to, to talk a bit about in a, in a column later today uh, that, you know, it is now the community's turn. I um, mean, the community now has to do its part. And that involves, you know, communicating, participating in these opportunities to respond and also respecting what the police have to do and now, you know, the, the training that they're going through and be the partner in this yeah. and, and give, give them the chance to, to prove uh, that they've always been, obviously, uh, caring. We've, uh, as a majority of officers, they certainly are. But the community has to step in and uh, you know, we'll have a lot more coverage mm -hmm. uh, today about this. Also, I wanted to, to take a minute to, to say that we're trying something a little bit different here. Uh, we want to hear from you and we want your comments posted here, but we're, uh, we're taking all of the comments um, from all the stories on this agreement and we're putting them in this post. Uh, this way we could better police those and we wanna really have a good discussion about what you think about the agreement, um, what you're hearing in the community. Um, basically, we want to keep the bozos out. You know, let's not make this, uh, you know, about being funny or trying to uh, make a racist comment and seeing if you can slip it in there. Uh, let's just have a conversation. So we hope you'll engage in that process mm -hmm. on this post and that we'll be able to watch it a little more closely and, and keep doing our part. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. And please check in with uh, Northeast Ohio Media Group and cleveland.com throughout the day and for the rest of the week. We'll have plenty of coverage uh, of this developing story.